Hi, I'm Alyssa Walker of Curbed in New York Magazine, and this is What is Even Happening, where New York's writers and editors ask experts to help us untangle questions in the news. This week, we're looking at why the rate of traffic deaths is going up, even as we've driven so much less during the pandemic. And I'd like to introduce our guest, Charles T. Brown, senior researcher and adjunct professor at Rutgers University. Hey, Charles. How are you doing? It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. So the numbers we got, they, we had this for the first six months of the year. And what it showed us was that, yes, traffic fatalities had gone down overall, but the rate per mile driven was actually higher than it had been in, in over a decade. So how is that even possible with, with fewer vehicles and, and fewer mile, miles being traveled? Well, because it's a matter of who is actually dying on our streets. It's also a matter of speed. So when you have less people out driving, you have a tendency for more people to speed. Um, and so speed, as we all know, leads to more deaths. Uh, you couple that with the fact that there are more people out biking, walking, and just enjoying the sort of built environment. Uh, it is a recipe for disaster. But what we have to do is sort of detangle that and start having conversations about who is dying on our streets, not just the simple fact that people are dying. And, and you, you and I have talked before about something which I think is, is kind of groundbreaking in the way we talk about who is dying. To shift the focus on who is driving and not just about the victims and where they're located and, and what they were doing when they were killed. Right. You know, one of the things that we know uh, in this country, we have a really good picture or grasp on who is being killed on our roadways. Unfortunately, what is not done is the parallel, which is who is actually hitting these pedestrians. We need a sort of national profile of those behind the wheel who have struck and killed pedestrians. Um, the reason why this is important to me is because they say in criminology, and I'm paraphrasing, that you sort of kill where you live. Whereas when it comes to driving, you kill where you traverse, traverse through. And so we need to understand the sort of origin and the destination of drivers compared to the origin and destination of pedestrians to see if people are indeed killing people where they live or is something else taking place. It's time again that we have a profile of the drivers, not just a profile of the victims. And, and even we've talked about what vehicles they're driving, which can mean the difference between life and death in many situations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm ex-military and I can tell you many of these vehicles now that are being driven on our streets look a lot like militarized vehicles. Um, that is unfortunately leading to an increase in the amount of deaths that are on our streets. And that's another thing I'm glad that many people are starting to pay attention to. You mentioned speeding, which I think it's clear in you know my neighborhood and and places in New York where we've kind of we discussed some, we'll discuss some of the data. Um, speeding is happening because you said the roads are so wide and people see that wide open road and immediately just floor it. What can be done either in a, a temporary um, emergency type situation like in the pandemic or in a more long term way just to stop that speeding? Well, first and foremost, we must design our roadways with the local, I, I would say with locals in mind, too often our roadways are designed around commuter traffic or the nine to five traffic. So what we're doing there is designing our streets in a way in which they benefit those coming into our cities and burden those living in our cities. So what we need are better roadway design standards. We need things such as pavement markings and, and better appearance. We need speed tables, humps and cushions. We even need many roundabouts. But we also need to reconsider many of our one-way streets in our cities and convert them to back to two-way streets. Uh, we need more bicycle and pedestrian-only streets or shared streets. And then lastly, um, and I'm not a huge fan of this, but I think it can work, is we need to really consider how we penalize and find those who are repeat offenders when it comes to drivers. So we need to look at things such as suspended driver's license, et cetera, to, to make it, or to force people to think for a second what the consequence of that, that bad behavior would be. And in New York City, they do have speed cameras and uh, they did note that they were giving about double the amount of tickets during part of the pandemic, which just goes to show you how 
maybe that was a deterrent. I don't know if it was, but hopefully people got one of those. Um, let's talk for a minute about the other kind of paradox that's happening. You mentioned this nine to five, our nine to five travel patterns are not what they used to be. We designed our roads for commuters, for people to kind of get in and get out of cities. But most of our trips now are more spread out throughout the day. And what's happening happened in the, the later months of the pandemic, especially in a place like New York is, you're seeing congestion at all times of the day. Like the cars have returned, even though people aren't necessarily going back to the office. So what does that tell us about how people are using streets and, and how we might want to shift them from someone who is in a car to the types of users who are using the streets all the time? Well, I think right away what happens, unfortunately, uh, is that you have the assumption that because you see cars throughout the day, that New York City residents as a whole have decided to drive more but what I would, what I assume is the opposite. What is happening is that those who have the sort of luxury of having access to a vehicle or driving into the city, they are doing that. And what they're showing you is that transportation, these alternative modes of transportation have been considered a luxury for some, those who drive, but it is a necessity for others. Because while we're also seeing an increase in the amount of times when people are driving into the city, we are also still seeing trends that show people who are heavily dependent on public transit, bicycle and pedestrian improvements, et cetera, are still using those modes. So it's basically, you're looking at what is a lux luxury for some versus a necessity for others. And as New York City moves forward, it needs to take that into consideration who was most dependent upon the transportation options that were provided by the city during the time of COVID-19. Those are the people that need the resources. And if they're prioritizing investments, that's where they should make their investment in those neighborhoods. That's a great point. And like we said before, the people who have been killed, cyclist deaths, uh, the highest they've been since 2014, since Vision Zero was started in the city. Um, and many of those people are, you know, living in lower income neighborhoods, they're black and brown New Yorkers, and they're people who don't have a, another choice to get around. They don't own a car. Correct. Yeah, and, and the issue is that not enough is being said about the who. We know the what. To a lesser degree, we know the how, but no one is talking about the who. And I'm so glad you brought that up because we know that disproportionately, those who are killed in this sort of uh, vehicle and pedestrian crashes are black, brown, and low-income communities. And these are the same people who are heavily dependent on alternative modes of transport. So they are the ones that are considering, um, that consider this to be a necessity for them and not a luxury when it comes to driving. And so that's where we need to make the investments. That's right. We have one question from Instagram. Are any U.S. cities getting this right? Is anyone able to reduce our traffic deaths? Yeah, that's such a big question. Um, I would say there are two cities. I'll be bi-coastal in my response that I think are doing a, a decent job. One is D.C., um, District of Columbia. They're doing a great job. And the city of Seattle. N neither of these cities are perfect, but I think they are making great strides at reducing the amount of violence, traffic violence we see on our streets. That's great and, and hopefully hopeful for the changes that we can make as uh, we merge back into a, a time when people will be going back to the office no matter how they get there and making it safer for people on all of our streets. Thank you so much for joining us today, Charles. Thank you, it's a pleasure being here. You take care and stay safe. Thank you.